Hello, my name is Molly Parker. I am one of the class third grade classroom teachers here at Whitman Post. I will be reading chapters 13 and 14 for you today. Chapter 13, Al. Tuesday, the dear cat has not come home. Miss Scroggin says if I stop bringing him his dish, he'll be back soon enough, but I can't bear to disappoint him. Today's Tuesday's tour was a lovely fourth grade class. From my broom closet, I could hear the shuffling from room to room and giggling at our toilet. Mrs. Baker, our tour guide, did an excellent job as usual. But as you can imagine, I have heard the Martinville History House tour speech many, many times, and so I sometimes tune it out. Today, chin resting comfortably on my knees, I closed my eyes and visited one of my happiest memories from my assistant librarian days, Book club. Before I was a ghost, my favorite thing about Wednes my favorite thing was Wednesday book club. On book club days, I was happy at work, even if Miss Scroggin had given me five reminders and seven criticisms before lunchtime. At three o'clock, I pretended to dust the window sills and watch my book club members arrive in ones and twos. Through the big front windows, I saw them get distracted by the bakery window or the stationery store, with its comic book rack just inside the front door. I had several times asked Miss Scroggin if we might have a comic section in our library, but this only led to more reminders and criticisms. Sadly, I can't remember their names anymore. There were seven or eight regulars every Wednesday, plus the boy. The boy always came to the library on book club Wednesdays, and on many other days as well. He walked the same path from the school to our library, but he wasn't like the others. I could see that he was mostly distracted by his own thoughts, and as I watched, I wondered what they were. At first, he barely looked at me. Then, when he came to the checkout desk with his pile of books, once, he showed up with a damaged return, and he had tried to repair the book himself with tape. As he walked in and brought the book straight to Miss Scroggin, and when she held it up, I nearly leapt over my desk to shield the boy from the criticisms that were about to rain down on him. His face was pointed at the floor, but I could see his ears were already bright red, and she had not yet begun. But she said nothing. She merely gathered up the broken book with the others and said, All on time, thank you, before turning away. Released, the boy flashed her a look of disbelief, gratitude, and then zipped away into the cool of the library stacks. I stood in near shock. Miss Scroggin, sometimes forget, was a very nice person. Despite her reminders and her criticisms, I thought, again, of mothers. Had a sudden urge to dust the light bulbs on the balcony just to make her happy. At closing time, I found her hunched over the work table in the basement, carefully taping the book's spine. Anyone could see that the child did not damage this book, she said. It was probably some brute bully. Why are you standing there with your mouth open? Don't you have things to do? I gathered myself and said, I have just finished dusting the balcony, Miss Scroggin. She nodded. I hope you didn't forget the light bulbs. I assured her I had not. But I have gone off on a tangent about Miss Scroggin. I was telling about book club Wednesdays. The club members were great readers, and we had a wonderful time listening to one another talk about books that we were reading. What about the story, what the stories were, and what we thought might happen next, and how all of it made us feel. These young readers felt things about books, which is why I call them great readers. Being a great reader has nothing to do with reading great sophisticated books, or reading great long books, or even with reading great many books. Being a great reader means feeling something about books. I had created a special book club area with a small rug around which I pulled up several book carts on Wednesday afternoons to make protective walls. It was our club room, and the door was always open. Actually, there was no door, 
only a space between two of the carts. But the point is that anyone could join our club. The members even posted invitations on the bulletin board near the big blue doors, or at the school, or in the town hall waiting room, and even in the grocery store parking lot. All welcome, they said at the top. Every Wednesday, I hoped the boy would join us on the rug, and every Wednesday, he did not. Instead, he sat at one of the library's two long tables, always in a chair closest to the rug, but with his back to us. And he was usually in his place well before our meeting began, so that it seemed almost to be a coincidence he was there, which I knew it was not. You've probably heard that you're supposed to be quiet in a library, but this was not true on Book Club Wednesdays. We did not even try to keep our voices down, but Miss Scoggin never said a word. If something funny was said, we liked to joke. I would sometimes glance over at the boy to see from behind just a hint of a rounded cheek, which meant he was smiling, but he never came to sit with us. Recognizing his cheek smile one Wednesday, I impulsively called out his name and said, Please come and join us. The boy seemed to shrink in his chair. He picked up his stack of books with both hands, and it was always a stack with him, and hurried away without looking back. I was worried that he would not be there the following Wednesday, but he was. I never called him out like that again. The book club rug was our safe place, a place where you could say what you thought. One day... After I shared a particular book, one that meant a lot to me, a club member spoke up to say that he had read it already and found it extremely boring. I listened to him, and he listened to me, and that was fine. I'm not supposed... I am not upset when others don't love the books I love. We each have our own book spaces inside us, and they do not match up perfectly, nor should they. The club members said goodbye that day as usual, all of us feeling like good friends. A few days later, the boy came into the library. It was Saturday, but he was, the f- he was there first thing in the morning, carrying his returns. But instead of going straight to the book return shoot, as he usually did, he carried his pile to my desk. I assumed Miss Scoggins, brute bully, had ripped another cover off one and prepared myself to reassure him. He placed the pile in front of me without a word, and I made my way through them, stamping each one with my date stamper. No ripped covers. Then I saw the last book in his pile was the very one I had talked about at Wednesday Book Club that week, the one I especially loved. Oh, I said and looked up, expecting to see the top of the boy's head, because he generally looked at the floor but not this time. He was looking straight at me. He covered the book with one hand, fingers spread, and announced, not boring. And then, for absolutely no good reason, tears filled my eyes. I told myself not to blink. For a few moments, we looked at each other, his hands still covering my book protectively. Then he turned and hurried away. From that day forward, the boy brought his returns to me from time to time. When he did, I knew there was a special book in his pile, a book that for him contained much. And I knew that when I got to it, he would simply cover it with his hand and meet my eye for a moment. Not all great readers wish to be in a book club. There are other ways of sharing books with very little conversation or none at all. Chapter 14, Mortimer. A few people had brought a book or two and squeezed them into the little library on its first day. One book had been left with a sticky note attached, my 100% favorite book of fifth grade. That book had been taken by a, a fourth grader within minutes. Mortimer felt content. More and more so, in fact. The first crate of books arrived on the second day, Tuesday right after lunch. Al was still bringing Mortimer's meals to him. She also sneaked in a few tight hugs, but he didn't mind. 
The crate was carried by Mis- Mr. Gregorian, who managed the grocery store. First, he tried to cram his books into Mortimer's little library, but then he saw that they would not all fit. Mr. Gregorian made a decision. He set his crate on the ground under the library, exactly in the spot where Mortimer had made his bed. He glared up at Mr. Gregorian. Mr. Gregorian said, I can tell that you approve, Buffy. Good girl. People, Mortimer thought. Nothing wrong with adding a little room to your library. Am I right? With this, Mortimer had to agree. Mr. Gregorian, after considering, carefully tilted the crate onto his side. This will help keep the rain out, he explained. It was an egg crate, Mortimer realized. From his history house window, he had enjoyed watching the farmers bring their deliveries. Eggs came to Mr. Gregorian's store twice a week. Mortimer hopped up on top of the crate. It was acceptable. Late that evening, he heard mouse voices again. I definitely smell cheese. I'm telling you, it's here somewhere. There were only two of them this time, zigzagging across the grass in the moonlight. Silent, Mortimer watched them come closer and closer. You can't smell it? Now it's even stronger. He could see them pretty clearly now. They were the same size and color, but they weren't exactly a matched set. One of them had a short tail. Oh, that's it, your tail, Mortimer erupted, and the mice froze right in front of him. Belatedly, Mortimer closed his mouth. Whoops. Now they would probably run away or start calling him names. He waited to see which it would be, but they did neither. Some instinct had paralyzed them, or almost, because he could see both of them quivering. The mice had sounded so brave the night before. Maybe they were just acting brave? Mortimer took a slow, backward step to see if that would release them. I'm not, he started. I mean, I won't do anything to you. Finn, it's just the grouch, one of them said. His tiny body relaxed visibly, but Finn was still stiff as a board. Finn, the mouse said, shake it off. We're okay. The grouch doesn't bite. Finn was trying to shake it off. Mortimer could tell. Still looking mostly frozen, Finn said, ha, close one, smiled weakly. Mortimer took another step back and spoke quietly. It was your tail that you dropped, wasn't it? and the hawk was left holding it. Your tail? You escaped? Finn nodded. Mortimer glanced at his own tail. Ouch, he thought. It's different for us mice, Finn said quietly. We're built to do it. It's like an escape trick. The other mouse nodded and glanced at where the tip of Finn's tail used to be. Right in the nick of time, the mouse said. It was very well done. And your tail will grow back? Mortimer asked. Again, Finn nodded. That's what my mom says. Interesting. Do either of you happen to know? Mortimer asked. Because these mice seem to know things. Why the frogs sing at night? Both mice shrugged. Then I guess you wouldn't know how they all know to stop singing at the same time? The mice looked at each other. Never thought about it, Finn mumbled. Is there cheese in that cupboard up there, by any chance? Finn's friend was pointing up at the library. It sure smells like cheese. The cheese cupboard doors, Mortimer realized, still smell like cheese. I'm sorry, he said stiffly. This is a library. No cheese around here. The mouse shrugged. Okay, we have to find food soon, so we should probably get going. Hungry, Finn added softly. Mortimer watched them back sl- watched them back slowly away, turn around and run. He almost wished he had told them where to find the potato bin, but that would m- upset Miss Scoggin. It was confusing.